My name's Frances Wood. I am retired curator of Chinese at the British Library, so have some connection, but I'm very happy this evening to introduce a, a lovely panel of experts who are going to talk about aspects of the Chinese in Britain, this long history. Um, we'll be taking questions later on and you can submit your questions to the panelists using the question box below the video. Um, and what I'm going to do now happily is introduce the, the panel that we have today um, in, as it were, a sort of chronological order Dr. William Poole, Senior Tutor at New College Oxford and Library Fellow, who is a tutor in English, but has an interest in the history of Sinology in Europe. And then Dr. Hargal, who is Senior Lecturer in Imperial and Global History at the University of Exeter. Um, his most recent book, um, Creating the Opium War, British Imperialist Attitudes to China, 1972 to 1840. And then Julia Lovell, who's Professor of Modern China in Birkbeck College, University of London, who's a, a noted translator of Chinese fiction, both classical and modern, and author of many books, including one on the Opium War. And she's currently co-curator of the British Museum's forthcoming summer smash hit exhibition, China's Hidden Century on the 19th Century. And then Dr. Anne Wichard, who's reader in English and cultural studies at the University of Westminster, author of several books on UK-Chinese cultural relations, like Lao Shi in London, and Zhang Yi and his circle. And she'll bring us up at least into the 20th century, if not further. But um, I'm very happy to say, can we start, please, with uh, William Poole, who's going to talk about Shen Fuzong, the early visitor to Oxford. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I speak to you from the tiny village of Garsington, just south of Oxford. And if you hear various yells, it is my children trying to go to sleep. Um, but I'm going to start by uh, talking about the earliest um, person in our in our story this evening, um, Shen Fuzong, um, who visited Oxford in the summer of 1687. So I have some slides for you. Um, so we will start here. It's summer of 1687, and the man on the English throne is James II. Now, he won't remain on it long. He's a Roman Catholic. He's picked one too many fights with his subjects, and he will soon be deposed. But his reign did offer a brief window of toleration, and through that window steps my subject for this evening, Shen Fuzong. For James's religion and reign allowed members of the International Jesuit Mission to visit England openly and safely, and by a happy coincidence, a party of China Jesuits was touring Europe in these years. And with them, they had something amazing, a Chinese Christian convert. And that is our man here. Now, Shen was the son of Christian converts from Nanjing. He was probably in his late 20s when he made the long journey to Europe. He took the Christian name Michael. And then when he entered the Jesuit novitiate, he took the additional name Alphonsus. He was competent in literary Chinese, but the real advantage he had was that the Jesuits had taught him to speak and write Latin. And this meant for the first time, the armchair observers of the West could meet and have a conversation with a literate Chinese person. Shen delighted the European potentates. Louis XIV even turned on the famous fountains at Versailles for him. He demonstrated the chopsticks and the kowtow. And when Shen arrived in London, he was quickly spotted. He took Latin classes in the Savoy. Apparently, he had a very peculiar accent. And when the famous chemist and philosopher Robert Boyle heard of him, he called him, interviewed him, and took notes on everything that Shen said. As for the king himself, he was so taken with the symbolism of this Roman Catholic visiting from the other end of the earth that he had the court painter, Sir Godfrey Nella, paint him. And that's the portrait you're looking at. And James II hung it in his bedroom. But perhaps the most interesting encounter happened in Oxford. There, the librarian of the Bodleian, an Oriental uh, languages scholar called Thomas Hyde, lured Shen to Oxford, arranged for him to be given board and lodgings, and even had him paid to help Hyde do something that no one else in England could do at this time. Catalogue the piles of Chinese or Chinese script books, including Japanese books, that had been mounting up in the Bodleian over the decades, but which no one could read. Famously, they didn't even know which way to hold them up. 
which way to open them. And so Shen sat with Hyde in the Bodleian through the summer of 1687, and the two men worked through the various books or bits of books printed in Chinese. Shen didn't always get it right. Um, he had trouble with the Japanese books. And often I think he just couldn't think of the right Latin word uh, when he was trying to translate the, uh, the titles for Hyde. But he vocalized all of them. He spoke them and he wrote down the vocalization of the Chinese title in his own handwriting. And he would then say the Latin words of the title as he could translate it to Hyde. And Hyde sitting next to him would write in his tiny Latin script those Latin titles. And those are the ones that we can see on all of this. Now, it didn't mean that people could read the books, but it was a start. Now, Hyde and Shen did much more than catalogue the books, though. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, um, for the next couple of minutes. Shen probably brought with him um, from Paris one of the most famous of uh, early Enlightenment books. Um, here is Hyde, by the way. I should have shown you that. I'm going to show you this portrait again in a moment and tell you something rather interesting about it. Um, but here is the book. Um, here is the book that uh, that Shen probably brought with him from Paris. This is an extremely important publication, 1687 Paris, fresh off the press, the Jesuit Latin translation of three of the four Confucian books, um, along with uh, an important preface and some chronological tables um, in which the Jesuits steered Western reception of Confucianism, trying to underline potential or indeed confected similarities between ancient Chinese philosophy particularly Confucianism, and what they saw as the modern Roman Catholic mission. When James II himself actually came to Oxford a couple of weeks after Shen had been there, he asked Hyde for this exact book here. Um, so this is a famous book. Now, Hyde quizzed Shen about all sorts of um, subjects, especially those dear to an, an Oxford scholar priest, such as Hyde was, Chinese numbers, language, religion, calendars, customs, weights, measures, even board games that we'll return to. This generated a pile of paper. Hyde hoped very much that he would be able to publish a book of all of this. He was going to call it the Adversaria Chinensia, and he tried to court Robert Boyle, we encountered the chemist in London, um, to fund this book. As printing Chinese characters was going to be very expensive in the late 17th century, would have to be done by engraving. But sadly, Boyle, who was usually pretty clubbable in this matter, didn't rise to the bait. The bones of this book, however, survive as a box of loose sheets in the British Library today. You can see them. If any of you are interested, it's Sloan 853A um, and is one of the most exciting manuscripts of all to look at. A box of papers written by Shen and Hyde in Chinese and Latin. Now, other activities um, included uh, um, looking at something quite different, which was maps. And I put up what most of you will recognize here who are in the know, which is one of the most famous uh, of all maps now, known as the Selden map, a late Ming map centered on the South China Sea. This astonishing map had arrived in the Bodleian by bequest in 1659. And in a manner that would horrify modern librarians, Hyde and Shen got out their pens and wrote directly onto this one of the most valuable maps in the world. And if you look very hard, you can still see Shen's tiny characters and Hyde's even tinier Latin script if you, if you, if you look hard at it. Now, Westerners were very interested um, in the geography of China at this point because they had realized about the 1644 Manchu conquest of China. Um, and so Hyde got Shen actually to look at this map and to copy out for him a section of all of the area around the Great Wall of China. And here he is. There it is. Shen has copied this out and Hyde and Shen got to work with it. Sorry, it's it's quite small. Um, but what's happening here is that Shen is writing the Chinese characters of the names of all the places around the Great Wall. He's telling Hyde what they are and Hyde is writing an even tinier Latin script, the names of these places. And this is pretty precise stuff for the period. Other things they did together. Well, um, Hyde is an, uh, an Anglican priest, um, pretending very hard that it's not a problem, that Shen is a, a Roman Catholic uh, convert. Um, so they write out the Lord's Prayer in Chinese. Um, and this gives us some glimpse into the way Chinese worked as a language and how Hyde might actually have started to see some things about grammar and syntax that were completely unknown to Western scholars who were entirely imprisoned in the context of Latin grammar. 
Perhaps most engagingly of all, though, Shen taught Hyde how to play Xiangqi, Chinese chess. Um, and after Shen left Oxford, Hyde bombarded him with letters. All of these, unfortunately, are lost. Um, but Hyde very carefully preserved all of Shen's replies. Um, and here is one. I've given you a picture of Shen replying there in Latin. But you can see Chinese characters in the middle. It's not a coincidence that the two characters here, as you'll see at once, are the names of Shang-Chi pieces. Uh, so Hyde is asking him, what was that we did in that board game there that we were playing? There's a reason for this I'll come to. Now, Hyde may have not got his big book uh, on Chinese published, but he did manage several smaller pieces. 1688, he produces a text on Chinese weights and measures. 1692, he publishes a book on Oriental board games, a famous book on the history of chess, in which he correctly says that it's Indian in origin, but that it's split into two different forms, and one went west uh, that we think of as chess, and one went east that we think of as Shang-Chi. And then in 1700, he published an astonishing book on Persian religion, um, in which he took occasion to talk about the Chinese calendar and the Chinese zodiac, again, copying out laboriously material that Shen had given him as they met. So the encounter with Shen did make it into print, and Hyde always refers to him in his Latin works, Hyde only writes in Latin, as Nostra Chinensis, or Chinensis Meus, and our Chinese, my Chinese. And later in life, he wrote to a London merchant about a man he'd not seen for a long time. Indeed, my friend Shen was a very knowing and excellent man, very studious, laborious in all things. He could speak Latin, and I could talk to him. But Hyde never heard from Shen again, and presumably could not have known that Shen never made it home, like so many he died uh, shipboard trying to get home off Mozambique of a fever in 1691. But when Hyde, at the end of his life, had a portrait of himself done, here he is again, he chose to have himself depicted holding a scroll. Not, as we might expect, a scroll in one of the languages of which Hyde was the professor at Oxford. He was the Regis Professor of Hebrew, the Laudian Professor of Arabic, as well as Bodley's Librarian. But, as you can see, in Chinese. Now, there were other Chinese visitors to London just after Shen. I found Chinese merchants or sailors passing through in 1693, 1697, 1702. These are extremely obscure visits, but none of them could make themselves understood. Shen's visit stands out as the first time, and indeed for a long stretch, the only time when an English person and a Chinese person actually managed to talk to one another. The very beginning of a very big a long conversation that will continue now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was that was lovely. Um, so from this first really kind of quite intimate and friendly and fruitful encounter, um, we move to Dr. Gao, who's going to talk about succeeding events and views. Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. And um, let me see where my slides are. Becky, is that ready? My slides. Right? Okay, so um, thank you very much for this um, introduction, Francis, first of all. And thank you also to the British Library for having me in this event. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit, well, eight minutes. <laughs> I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the origins of the Opium War and what it has to do with the complex British perceptions of China. Because I think for our theme today, Chinese and British, it'd be interesting to look at the relationships, um, not only in peacetime, but also when tensions and conflicts occurred. Um, this talk will also contain a snippet view of my recently published book, Creating the Opium War, next. Um, yep, um, if you would like to, to explore it a little bit further. So um, yes, many of us have heard of the Opium War or may have had a pre-existing understanding of why the war broke out. Um, but anyway, for those of you who are not experts who are not familiar with it. Uh, next, please. This war was the first time China filed a major war against 
a European power. Um, some historians argue that it constituted a, a clash of empires of the 19th century because this was a war between the greatest empires in the East and in the West. Um, historians of China for generations often see this conflict as the starting point of a modern Chinese history, you know, because they believe that it sort of opened up China to the so-called modern world dominated by the West and started the so-called uh, century of humiliation in Chinese history. Um, although increasingly these views have been challenged for various reasons. And more broadly, within the recent scholarship, the study of the Opium War has been a rapidly rising field in the context of global history. Uh, the significance of the war, in fact, has lately been compared with that of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, or even the Second World War, as more and more historians around the world tended to argue that, well, the history, the story about the beginning of the modern world should not simply be told in, in Western terms. Um, so, the Opium War is just this kind of critical event that connected the West with China. It started a new chapter anyhow and had profound consequences in the history of the world, especially with a view of global connectivity. Now, what interests me the most are basically two questions. First, why was there such event between such a war between China and Britain? And second, why did this war break out at this point in time? Um, obviously, there have been various explanations on this. The uh, next, please. Yeah, the most old school historians tended to say that, well, the war was caused by the irreconcilable conflict between Britain's economic expansion and China's containment policy. They believe that a Sino-British war was inevitable because Britain was so keen to expand its trade overseas with China in particular in order to sell its surplus products. And according to these historians, opium was unimportant. Opium was replaceable. It was the only instrument. Um, it, it was only an instrument of British commercial uh, expansion. If it was not called the opium war, it could have been anything else. Okay, a uh, rice war or a molasses war or whatever. And, um, and then a revisionist school of historians, which have now become quite old school as well, tended to say, no, no, although that we agree, we agree the war was inevitable, the fundamental problem was not economy, but culture. Okay, because there was a fundamental cultural conflict between what we believe, what they believe, conservative China and progressive Britain. And then based on that, a further revisionist school uh, emerged and said, well, um, if you study that opium trade carefully, you would find that that trading opium did play a vital role in causing the war. So it was not about generally uh, expanding trade, selling surplus products, it's not about cultural differences, which all have been exaggerated as a cause of the war. The real fundamentally decisive factor is that triangle trade within Britain, China, and India, because it is so crucial to Britain and its imperial rule in India, um, nothing but opium triggered that war. So based on this existing scholarship, what my own research was trying to add is a perceptional point of view, how Britain viewed, understood, interpreted China, and how these impressions were linked with the outbreak of the Opium War. Um, I think this is particularly interesting because in the centuries before, uh, 17th, 18th centuries, Britain and Europe in general actually developed a huge enthusiasm about China, almost anything Chinese, tea, porcelain, silk, you know, wallpaper, or even Chinese ways of living were what Europeans were passionately chasing after. So how was the war possible then? Um, I know we have very limited time on this, but to sum it up in a nutshell, um, yes, we, uh, next please. 
as we know generally from the 17th to the early 19th century, there was a shift of attitudes from viewing China very positively to being increasingly um, critical of it. But in the meantime, uh, one point that I would like to highlight is that when it comes to so-called British perceptions, British views, it has always been a complex and mixed picture. Uh, we should not all think in a one nation, one view kind of way. Um, to give you a quick and specific example, in the decades before the Opium War, within the British communities in China, there were actually largely two groups of merchants and they held fundamentally different views towards China, uh, but basically to suit their own economic purposes because uh, the context was the British East India Company's monopoly on the China trade was to be abolished or renewed in 1833. Therefore, the decades before it um, actually had a long-term debate on what Britain should do in China and, ch and how China was actually like, still within the, B uh, the EIC framework or open it up for, for free trade completely. Okay, so next, let's take a look at um, this slide. And um, as you can see that the EIC side tended to say that, well, China is completely different. China do not need international trade. That principle of free trade is actually not applicable in China. Whereas the so-called free traders tended to say that, no, no, China is, completely, is not completely different. Those people do need international trade just like we do although their government does not want them to. Hence, that principle of free trade is, not, uh, is actually very applicable to China. And, then, and, and also the EIC said, well, pay, we should pay respect to Chinese laws, respect their sovereignty, and blah, blah, blah. The free traders tended to say, no, no, um, because they are essentially illegal, you know, there's no need to respect their laws. The EIC said, you know, the Chinese people appear to fear, appear to reason. Free traders said Chinese people appear to fears. And the EIC tended to say, well, we need to be nice to them, talk to them, try to persuade them. Conciliatory policy. Free traders tended to say, no, no, we want to be firm, firmness and determination. But overall, what they were actually trying to say is, I spelled them out, the EIC was trying to say that, well, ultimately that EIC system should be maintained, whereas the free traders tended to argue that system should be abolished and opened up for free trade. So um, I think all I'm trying to say is that, well, next please. Well, it's actually my, my book again. And I think all I'm trying to say is that these different perceptions really mattered. And they mattered greatly to the happening of the first major conflict between Britain and China. And apparently they still resonate today um, in many, many ways, basically one hawkish and one um, dovish, right? And these perceptions were the key underlying factors that deserve further attention, further research, because the more we know about how we started our tensions and conflicts in the past, the better I believe it would guide us in our, in our engagements today and in the future. Okay, thank you. Very much. Um, I mean, it's it's fascinating to see the development of this of the the hawk and dove view. And, and before this, um, when we were sorting out this um, event, we talked a little bit about um, Chinese perceptions of of Britain, which is an area that we haven't gone into this evening, but which I think is a very interesting one because the general view of the merchants was that the Chinese kind of knew nothing and didn't understand and so on, whereas in fact we know there was quite a lot of information. However, to pursue again um, the question really of, of attitudes and what happens particularly in the, the 19th century, can I ask um, Julia to, to take on from, from Dr Gao and, and explain more? Of course. Can you hear me? Um, I'm afraid I've gone rather low tech. I'm just going to speak, so no no slides for me. Thank you so much, Francis, for that introduction. Many thanks for, to the British Library for um, curating this wonderful exhibition and for um, running this 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 event. Um, uh, so, how just now has taken us 
vividly and eloquently through interactions between China and Britain up to the late 1830s. I have the unenviable task of talking in more detail about one of the most painful and scandalous episodes in interactions between Britain and China, uh, by which I mean the two opium wars of 1839 to 42 and 1856 to 60. Um, how um, has already touched on these um, events, I'm going to give a brief a further overview of the causes and events of these wars and also say a few words about their complex and long-term impact, perhaps dwelling a little bit more on how they have shaped Chinese perceptions um, of Britain and other Western countries. Um, I would um, propose that to um, understand some aspects of China's uh, relationship today with Western countries like Britain, you have to understand the Opium Wars. So the Opium Wars are very widely taught both in Chinese public history and in schools and in textbooks. Um, and there'll be an obvious contrast um, to anybody in our audience who's been through the British school system. You all know it's very possible, even easy to sail through a very good um, education in Britain without encountering um, either of the Opium Wars first. Um, but I would counter and um, how definitely introduced um, this uh, landscape to us um, just now. I would counter that the Opium Wars are pivotal events in not just Sino-British relations, um, but also in modern world history. Um, so they're not the sort of sudden moment at which China uh, becomes open to the outside world. But I think that the Opium Wars are significant in being the first conflict between China and a, a European or a Western country. And these wars um, do end up dragging China violently into a, what is then a, a Western dominated uh, modern international world. So how has explained with great nuance the complexity of British perceptions of China um, uh, and the uh, possible um, complex causes of the Opium Wars. In my own mind, I would argue that the imperatives of cold hard cash and profit were the most immediate causes of the two Opium Wars. Until the early years of the 19th century, uh, Britain ran a trade deficit with the Qing Empire in China. Um, you know, China for many centuries had been one of the centers of the global luxuries trade and British merchants trading at Guangzhou, the port in South China, would fill their ships with um, coveted, covetable Chinese luxuries, um, silk, ceramics, uh, and for the British market, above all, tea. Um, but until the early 19th century, um, there seemed to be no British um, made commodity that Qing China wanted enough of to balance the books in this trade. So as a result, tens of millions of silver dollars were flowing out of Europe and uh, into China. But um, as how explained by the 1830s, the British thought they'd found a solution to their economic difficulties in China, uh, Indian opium, for which Chinese consumers had increasingly developed a taste over the preceding three decades. So between 1800 and 1839, imports of opium into China from British India increased uh, tenfold from about 4,000 to 40,000 chests a year. And China was losing perhaps 300 million silver dollars net over this period through this business. Um, and this trade gave Great Britain uh, silver uh, um, to trade in Asia. Um, it funded the British tea habit and customs raised on tea imported into Britain funded the Royal Navy. So there's a very direct link between the opium trade, tea, and British imperial power in the 19th century. Um, and Britain did 
more than just profit from drugs, it fought wars for them too. So between 1839 and 1842, it launched an expedition to attack the Qing government's refusal to legalize uh, the contraband opium trade. By 1839, the emperor of the Qing dynasty, Daoguang, was increasingly concerned about China's growing trade deficit fueled by its opium imports, as well as, of course, worried about the impact of uh, growing drug addiction. And Daoguang sent a special commissioner, a man called Lin Zexu, to Guangzhou to put a stop to British opium trading and to the silver drain out of China. And that spring, Lin destroyed around 20,000 chests of opium that British smugglers had brought to uh, the South China coast. The British government uh, quite promptly responded by sending a fleet to China to avenge the destruction of British property and to recoup the money for the lost opium. For the next two and a half years, between 1840 and 1842, British gunboats blasted China's coastlines. Uh, they moved between Guangdong in the far south and cities like Shanghai on the east coast. It was a long and often grisly war. It wasn't a fair fight. The British had some of the most advanced weapons and shields in the world at the time. Many of the Qing armies were still using bows and shields. And the British strategy was simple. They wanted to take Nanjing on the east coast, where the grain supply boats start traveling up the Grand Canal to Beijing, the capital of the empire. Um, so at this point in history, if you were to hold Nanjing, you would hold the Qing empire by its throat. And so that's what the British did. In the summer of 1842, British ships had their guns pointed at Nanjing and uh, Daoguang, the Qing emperor, negotiated. So he handed over 21 million silver dollars in compensation and Hong Kong. So the island formally became British in the Treaty of Nanjing that concluded the Opium War in 1842. So um, Hong Kong, as it is today, and all the Sino-British history of connections that it's generated, Hong Kong would not, as it exists today, would not exist without opium. And it took only 14 years for a second conflict to break out between China and Britain, the Second Opium War, and the causes were again mainly economic. So between 1842 and 1856, export of British manufacturers to China declined, while sales of tea and silk to Britain um, again soared. And it was only rising profits from the opium trade that saved the British balance of payments. But at this point, Brit uh, opium was still illegal in China and British officials feared a new crackdown in the early 1850s. So the British prime minister was searching opportunistically for a pretext to open the whole of China to British traders and missionaries. And in 1856, he found it and he seized it. Um, so Chinese Qing officials in Guangzhou captured a Chinese pirate ship, um, allegedly flying the British flag. Palmerston declared this was an insult to the British national honor and launched a fresh campaign against China, this time with French cooperation. The first treaty was agreed in 1858, but didn't hold. Anglo-French forces returned to China in 1860 and they overran Beijing and looted and burned the Emperor's Summer Palace northwest of the city. And this destruction stands in both Chinese and Western memory as one of the standout acts of aggression by European empires against China. And the new treaty after the final stages of the Second Opium War in 1860 opened China wide open to the West. Um, so this treaty gave Britain the right to establish an embassy in Beijing, the freedom to travel and uh, work all over China. And the treaty also legalized opium. So it added the drug to a list of legitimately taxable goods. So 20 years after the first Opium War began, Britain had opened China to trade um, and had guaranteed the stability of its most profitable commerce in opium. But the cost to Sino-British relations was huge because these wars have cast a long shadow over China's relations with countries like Britain. So for at least a century, public memory of the Opium War in China has served as the founding episode of Chinese patriotism and nation building. 
it begins what popular Chinese histories uh, in documentaries, museums, films and textbooks term the uh, century of humiliation by the West, uh, which only ends with the Second World War. And this view of the Opium War also stands as, as beginning China's battle to stand up as a strong modern nation against the West. So in contemporary China, the Opium War is the tragic curtain raiser on China's modern history. And although you get a much greater range of opinions in specialist academic debates um, in China, I think that in public political discussion, at least, the Opium War um, serves to serves almost as a shorthand to define a history of interactions with the West that has often been dominated by a Western hypocrisy um, and even plots to weaken China. As Anne is about to explain, there are many positive stories also, of course, to be told about British Chinese interaction. Uh, but here in Britain, uh, we need to understand as well how and why China remembers events like the Opium Wars and the long range impact that they've had on their perception of relations uh, with, with, with Britain and other Western countries. Thank you very much, Julia. I think. Um... Uh, we, we are quite right to stress the significance still of the Opium Wars on the sort of, um, it, uh, it's sometimes dismissed in, in the UK, you know, which is a bit rich coming from a nation obsessed with two world wars still, I think. But, you know, to say, oh, you know, they're always looking back, you know, they can't move on from the Opium Wars. But I think there is, in a slightly more positive way, I think many people in China have a much greater sense of history than than we do, and that that, that the past is still quite alive to them. I. I never forget meeting an elderly monk on a Buddhist holy mountain called Jiu Hua Shan. Um, and he was living in a little hut. Um, he used to come down to the temple every morning for his vegetables for the day and go up to his little hut. And he had a big bell and he would ring it when pilgrims came by. And when we came by, three of us, he said, England, England. Um, he said, don't you have a queen? This was a very old man. And we said, yes, we did. And he said she must be very old by now. And I'm sure he was thinking of Queen Victoria, you know, that history was quite elastic to him in a way that's, that that um, we don't feel quite so much. Anyway, as Julia said, we, we we can move on. As I think one of the nice things about the exhibition is the um, the memories that people have and that, that can be seen in the exhibition of more recent visitors to China. And I think uh, visitors to the UK from China and um and Dr. Anne Richard will take us on, I hope. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Francis. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about a relatively forgotten community of Chinese artists and writers who made their home in the London borough of Hampstead in the 1930s. Um, Hampstead is a neighborhood synonymous with 20th century art and architecture. So a stroll around will re reveal multitudes of blue plaques to commemorate its well-known residents, Marcel Breuer, Piet Mondrian, Erno Goldfinger, Lee Miller and Roland Penrose, to name just a random few. During the interwar period, it was very much a multicultural community. Many of the more recent inhabitants had fled Nazi persecution, but it's less well known that among them were also emigres from China. These Chinese writers and artists have received far less attention than their British and European neighbours, but during the years before the Second World War, they played a significant role in British cultural and political life. Um, ooh, that's it. Yes. Um, so they were exiled for different reasons, but all highly educated. The small group of Chinese men and women who settled in the Hampstead area were instrumental in reshaping conceptions about China. They had extensive interactions with London's cultural elites and they were engaged in anti-fascist political activism. Perhaps best remembered of them today, thanks to his prolific silent traveller series, is the writer and painter Chang Yi. Chang had been forced to leave China in 1933, resigning from his magistrate post due to the corruption that characterized much local government at the time. Sorry, I'm being a bit um, slow with these. Uh, he moved into the second floor maisonette of a Victorian house 
on Hampstead's Upper Park Road, which was occupied by fellow natives of Jiangxi province, the playwright Shui Sheng and his wife Dimya. Among the Sheng circle of friends in Hampstead included Xiao Chen, the essayist, translator and newspaper reporter, the writer Tsui Shi, the poet Zhuang Li Shi and his wife Lu Jingqing, and the literary translator Xiang, sorry, Yang Xianyi. There they are. There, there are their names and dates. Um, so it was one of solidarity, mutual sustaining conviviality, but it was far from an introverted group. During the 1930s, the Shungs were household names, thanks to the success of Shung's play, Lady Precious Dream. There you can see the um, playbook for it at the Little Theatre. And then it moved to the West End, where it ran for over 900 nights before transferring to Broadway. It was critically acclaimed by literary figures, including J.B. Priestley, J.M. Barry, George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells. And some years later, Dimia Shung published her account of the period, Flowering Exile. Shung was an excellent networker. Uh, here he is. Um, a photograph of him outside Claridge's with movie stars Anna Mae Wong and Paul Robeson. And more than that, he was happy to share his connections with his compatriots. So among the many useful contacts Chang Yi met in Upper Park Road was the famous Chinese painter Liu Hai Su, who came to London in 1934 to mount an exhibition of modern Chinese painting. Staying at Upper Park Road, Liu met Chang and invited him to show his work in the exhibition, and this really helped to launch him. The sharing of introductions was reciprocal, so later during the war years, Chang would recommend Xiao Chen and Xiong to the BBC when he was not available to speak himself. He put forward Sui Chia in discussions over works about Chinese history for the children's imprint Puffin Books. The late 1930s was an era, era of cultural openness between Britain and China. Chinese culture had galvanized the imagination of modernist writers. Productive transnational friendships had developed between certain members of the Bloomsbury group, such as that of Virginia Woolf and Ling Xu Hua, whose photograph features on the poster for this exhibition at the British Library. However, what would distinguish the Shungs and Chang and their circle was their desire to reach a more general public and their shared mission to reconfigure negative images of China and Chinese people in Western eyes. Um, Chang's Silent Traveller series was an innovative attempt to synthesize two diverse cultures at a time when the Yellow Peril discourse persisted as an influence in the British consciousness. His books about Chinese art and culture, along with his lectures broadcast on the BBC, marked a period in which Chinese artists and writers began to communicate information about their culture, their cultural heritage, directly. In 1935, the landmark international exhibition of Chinese art at the Royal Academy was seen by half a million people, and this marked a pivotal turning point in attitudes to China. Xiong had introduced Chang to Methuen publishers, who put out the Chinese Eye and, the Chine and Chinese Calligraphy, and they were marketing the works now as authentic presentations of Chinese principles by an actual Chinese author, Chinese aesthetic principles. In the years before the Second World War, this was a shift that was encouraged by newspaper editors, critics and book publishers who were sympathetic towards China. Chinese contributors were actively sought out by John Lehman for his Penguin New Writing series, while among their Hampstead neighbours were Noel Carrington at Puffin Books and Herbert Reed. Herbert Reed was a member of the Artists International Association, as were other Hampstead locals, including Roland Penrose and Chang Yi. So as Japan stepped up its incursions in China, the Hampstead Chinese were active in educating the public about the significance of Chinese resistance and in raising funds for aid to China. In 1936, Xiong and Chang were delegates to the International Peace Campaign Congress in Brussels. 
Wang Lishi, in political exile for opposing Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist regime, was a key participant in transnational anti-fascist movements. He was close to the leftist writers Sylvia Townsend Warner, he was published in the Left Review, and his poems were read on the BBC. Xiao Chen's survey of contemporary Chinese literature, Etchings of a Tormented Age, persuaded another Hampstead neighbour, Eric Blair, better known as George Orwell, who was then head of the BBC's Far Eastern Division, that a series on Chinese writers was overdue. So the extent of these connections gives us a sense of the socio-geographical importance of Hampstead to its Chinese residents before they were forced to relocate in the 1940s as a result of the Blitz. But having dispersed, they continued to be involved in cultural and political activities. World War II was to prove a key moment when Chinese writers in Britain, supported by a network of editors and publishers, sought to enhance understanding of their country and their people through literature and other cultural expressions. Chang and Chen's various contributions to war-related activities and their attempts to draw parallels between the twin struggles of Britain and China against the Axis powers a testament to their position in British society. These are some beautiful hand-painted uh, note papers by Chang Yi, that, made by Chang Yi, um, and on them are letters between the BBC and Xiong and Chang and various other people. Um, yes, so anyway, to conclude, this group comprised an important social and intellectual network of Chinese writers and artists resident in London in the years before and during the war. Um, I'll just show you, oops. That's, I'll skip through these because we haven't got much time. That's Xiao Chen broadcasting on the BBC. Uh, this is a poster of Chang Yi's involvement in the revival of British ballet, um, which happened during the Second World War. And finally, it's fair to say that historians have generally overlooked Chinese engagement with cultural production in Britain during the 20th century. There are many more figures I could mention, but time will not allow that. Um, if you're interested, this book, which um, Francis was involved in as well as myself, together with my co-editors, Paul Bevan and um, Da Jung from America, um, this you can read more about it in here, but no doubt this will lead to further discoveries about the Chinese in Britain during the 20th century. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, it, it does seem to me that that I hope that the exhibition, you know, though small, will also provoke more production, provoke more memories of people, provoke more writing about and study about the period, the long period, because it it seems to me there is. You know, we've had these wonderful talks, all kind of separate points in the in this long history, and there's so much more that could be um, said and and found out. And um, we've got kind of a long way to go, um, I think. And I hope that you know the exhibition provokes thought in that way. Um, I don't seem to be getting any messages through. Um, I don't know if there's anything on a chat box. I mean, I don't get. Um, I haven't got anything here. So. Um, I'm going to say first of all, I've got I've got one or two housekeeping things to say, and then perhaps we can discuss what we have um, learned from each other. That the the, the the housekeeping things that I'm meant to say are that um, you the viewers can use the tabs above the video to provide the BL with feedback on the cultural events programs, to buy books linked to the exhibition and to donate to the library, and also would recommend that anyone. Um, anyone present in any way keeps an eye on the British Library's website to see what other events are linked with the exhibition. Um, and you can watch past events on the BL iPlayer. But um, can I throw, can I throw, um, because I'm not getting anything from, <laughs> I'm supposed to get a kind of series of messages and I haven't got anything here. Can I throw the, the discussion open to all of you? Please unmute yourselves. How Julia and and Will um, and uh, has anybody got any kind of particular reaction to the things that they've heard today? I mean, I could start with um, my 
my memories of Shen Fuzong in the British Library. And I, I must ask, Will, because I, I don't remember clearly, isn't it fairly recently that um, the, the list of the Bodleian books was discovered in the Shen Fuzong, Fuzong papers? I mean, I seem to remember, I used to show them to people, I say, oh, these are Hyde's Chinese lessons. But because I don't wasn't in the Bodleian and didn't realise, didn't look carefully, I was busy looking at the abacus and the the amazing and amusing things that you find um, that the, I didn't notice the book list. And I think it was really only discovered within the last 20 years or so. But you, you could correct me. That's possibly true. I, I, I read through the, the, the whole box of it. Uh, I Being a man who's kind of more of an intellectual historian on this side of the world and that side of the world, um, uh, I, I saw it and, and I, I sent it to a, a good mutual friend of ours, the Chinese librarian here. And I think they were a bit surprised that uh, actually there was a base list of all the books that were here. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know who had, who had seen this before, <laughs> before me, um, but it was not hidden. Uh, it's the usual thing of looking at the papers again and seeing what is there. There are an awful lot more like that as well. Actually, the merchant Thomas Bowery in the East India Company papers in the um, British Library is another lovely place to look for Thomas Hyde talking to Bowery about all sorts of going beyond China to um, all sorts of other um, um, Eastern nations and their languages and scripts and what we can do about it. Um, and often it's simply just that it's always been sitting there. But that, as you know better than anyone, Francis, we're sitting inside massive institutes <laughs> and all the wood is just simply there in front of us. There's just so much we can't see it. However, if, if I were to sort of throw a, a large scale question open to everyone, I would think that one of the controlling ideas here is about about sort of... V- putting on one side for a moment the Chinese reception of, of British culture, but thinking about the British reception of Chinese culture is, is the axis of sinophilia and sinophobia. Um, you know, what is it that attracts? What is it that repels? And how these things change over time? It seems to me that that's the, that's the kind of guiding narrative um, that goes through these these things. And it'd be interesting to see. I mean, it is a, a kind of a a, a well-known idea that um, we start off in the extremely sinophile position um, and that that maybe changes in the 18th century, um, discuss. Um, we may have simplified that a little bit too much um, and that that ends up in a certain, you know, in, in warfare, obviously. Um, but then when actually cultural penetration is, is, is easier because of basic things to do with trade and, and, and boats and, and, and uh, cultural movement, that the situation becomes a little bit more interpenetrating. Um, but it seems to me that that's probably the common thread that unites all of our discussions is the balance between a kind of the factors of attraction and repulsion. What are they and why are they? What are people interested in? in my period, for instance, people are interested in actually what are extremely Western ideas. Uh, you know, how old do you think the world is? What's your philosophy? And is it compatible with the Bible? Um, and it is very interesting watching people actually detect the idea of cultural difference and the celebration of cultural difference. Th- that is very hard to see, uh, not least because people find it very hard to articulate it at the time. That's me kind of um, producing a question off the back of your quite in- innocuous question, uh, Francis. But I guess what I would say is that, that, that that's the, the golden thread um, between these conversations. Got a message now, finally, um, which is very long from um, from someone. I'm a British-born Chinese and never learned about this in history at school. With increasing tensions between Western countries and China, how can we include this part of the Brit- of Britain's history into the curriculum so that our future citizens understand the aggressive stance Britain took towards China and the importance of the Opium Wars? This will help children understand why China does not have a favourable attitude towards Western interference. Um, and not just hearing the negative portrayal of China, which is constantly in the media. Um, I fear the negative depictions of China will lead to sinophobia for future generations. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, which, Julia, are you? Yeah, well, I com- completely, completely support um, that um, member of the audience's idea 
that, um, first of all, more British imperial history in general should be taught in schools. Um, but China should become a part of the curriculum. I mean, I have three children aged between 19 and 10. Um, so I've seen the oldest one. Um, obviously, she, she gets exposure to East Asia at home. Um, but, uh, but sort of without that push from home, I, you know, she wouldn't have done any Chinese history at school. I think it briefly appeared um, within geography A level contemporary contemporary China. Um, uh, but at the moment, I think there are only two places in the national curriculum when uh, Chinese history can be included, and they are purely optional. I think there's one place in Key Stage 2, which is ages uh, 7 through to 11, um, when um, Chinese archaeology, the earliest historically recorded dynasty, the Shang, can be taught, but it's optional. So it's you, you either teach the Shang or you teach ancient Egypt, and given how um, how much material there is um, on ancient Egypt, I would um, I would bet good money on most extremely hard pushed primary school teachers um, going for ancient Egypt over the Shang. And then I think there's a moment in um, somewhere between sort of age uh, sort of years eight and nine, um, when they might learn about the Qing dynasty, but again, it's an option. Um, and you, I think at the moment in the British educational system, you have a vicious circle whereby, you know, extremely hardworking, hard pressed teachers, they don't learn Chinese history at school or at university. Um, so it becomes a sort of high risk, extremely effortful process for them to try to bring it into the curriculum because they don't have that background. So it's entirely understandable that when it remains so optional um, that they they don't have the time and the bandwidth to to do this. So and then the next generation get, don't get exposed to um, any Chinese history. Um, so I uh, completely, completely support that idea of making China a, a, a mainstream part of the curriculum. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And another point that I would like to add is in addition to knowledge, what happened in history, you know, the content side of it is also skill. And, and at the heart of it, I think it should be critical thinking, right? And here in the history department, you know, in University of Exeter, I'm sure in any other British universities, we tend to ask our students to distinguish what is a fact and what is an interpretation or an argument, right? For example, the Opium War broke out in 1839. That was a fact. Okay. Um, but why did it happen in that year? You know, why did the war break out? It's down to your interpretations, right? As I've shown in my in my talk. So I think at the same time, if the more that we learn to think things in a critical way, and the more we are aware of these differences between a fact and argument, we will be starting to learn that, okay, maybe these media portrayals is just some people's personal interpretations and it's, you know, it's, it's more subjective than um, people might have thought. Okay, because when it comes to Western, British, European perceptions of China, it was and has always been dominated by these two extremes. You have Sinophilia on the one hand, people think China absolutely wonderful. You have Sinophobia on the other hand, people think China is, China is horrible, right? So um, back to my point, in addition to teaching our next generation about what had happened as historical facts, but also if we can train them with all this kind of critical thinking skills, maybe it's down to them to find out, okay, if you're interested in this, if you agree or disagree, go back to these historical sources and, and find out your own answer to it. Yeah. Thank you. I've got here now a question, it says for William Poole, although I think looking through it, it actually is a bit more general. Um, you talked about the challenges of early communications for British and Chinese people. The 14-year-old, whose name I can't recall, it's young Staunton, who accompanied the McCartney expedition, who had studied Mandarin for only two years, is credited as one of the interpreters of that mission. Have you come across any contemporary discussions of the impact of having someone who had studied only two years trying to interpret? <laughs> no, uh, uh, <laughs> not 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 not. Um, that brief, I don't think. Um, I, th I think this this is a question I would say should be referred 
the the um Amy from Amy Summers could read um, a very a recent book by a colleague in Oxford, Henrietta Harrison. Yeah, you know she's just produced a book called something like The Question of Interpreters, which mm. is all about young Staunton, um, who was taken on the McCartney embassy yeah. by his father, yeah. um, you know, seventeen ninety two to four. So he grew up in that time, learned a bit of Chinese from the mm. a, a couple of Chinese Jesuits that the the uh, McCartney had taken on board at. Well, in fact, in London, but he sort of grabbed them from Naples. Mm. Um, and there, she's written this whole book, which is all about the question of interpretation. And of course, yeah, two years to interpret depends how much you've studied. But I don't know if, if Julia or Hal has anything to say more about that. Well, I, 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 I jump in immediately just to, to say one thing that is very important for Western scholarship here is the distinction between spoken and written language. Um, and that is a massively important distinction. Um, obviously, um, the greatest fascination of all um, in the West was what is this character system? Um, and that persists right through the 18th century and into the early 19th century about is there a rationality behind this? It seems extremely complicated. How can you have a monosyllabic language with characters with up to 24 strokes or something like that in them? Um, so the, the question of learning has to be parsed about you know, whether we're talking about speaking whether we're talking about writing and reading. Um, but I will hand over to more learned hands now. But things coming thick and fast. Regarding the opium wars, why were the Chinese not interested in British manufactured goods, especially engineering? Anyone clear to? I, I'm, I, I, one episode that's actually not been mentioned, um, which has been re-examined in the historiography over the last... 20, 30 years um, is an earlier, well, an episode which Francis just mentioned, in fact, the um, uh, the first official British embassy sent to um, China, then ruled by the Qing dynasty in 1793, the McCartney Embassy. Um, and this is the uh, an, an event in which, yes, this, this, this embassy is sent from Britain, sort of led by a, um, a high-ranking British official, Lord McCartney, um, and uh, he brings with him what he thinks are the, the, the sort of fruits of British science and manufacturing, and the hope is that um, these this will showcase the wonders of British technology and learning and will convince uh, Qing China um, that they want to buy more such manufacturers um, from Britain. Um, and a historian called James Hebe about 30 years ago had a, a, took a, a fresh look, a new look at this um, uh, embassy and Henrietta Harrison in her recent book. I think I think it's the perils of interpreting. I might I might have might have got that got that got that title wrong. Has also very fruitfully taken a new look at it through the ideas of its. In, through the through the eyes, eyes of its interpreters, but Hevia's um, sort of fresh take on it was that the kind of traditional British view of the embassy had been that it was the the sort of the the purest expression, if you like, of this um, very sort of strong sinophobic view of China, which is sort of that 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 China um, has always been this sort of incredibly self-confident, um, even um, isolationist cultural entity, um, which um, throughout its thousands of years of existence as a coherent political entity um, has consistently, you know, not thought itself self-sufficient, not needed to um, uh, sort of learn or draw anything from the outside world. And so the McCartney embassy in which the Qing Emperor says, um, basically, thanks, but no thanks. Um, I'm not super impressed by this. Um, and no, you cannot position an embassy in, in Beijing. Um, uh, sort of very sort of polite, but firm, no. Um, and um, and he, I think one of the great values of Hevia's account is that he sort of really pulled apart, sort of questioned that very traditionalist sort of scornful view of the Qing that came through British perceptions of the McCartney embassy and its outcome. Um, and instead sort of revealed a, a, a sort of late 
Ching political apparatus that was, you know, you know, really quite decently informed about the British, was aware of what they were getting up to in India, you know, had taken the measure of them um, as, you know, a big sort of imperial maritime threat. Um, but, you know, sort of late Ching China was one of the biggest, most successful, most populous and most prosperous empires in the world, not uh, just at that moment, but you know, arguably in human history. This enormous, enormous enterprise, which had been sort of bolted together through conquests in the 18th century, um, uh, sort of huge um, uh, economic leaps forward um, through new world crops and um, uh, trade, both domestic and international. Um, so this was a, a, a place that had you know, conquered all its traditional enemies. Uh, had um, uh, the, the the sort of Qing, Qing emperors um, had at their disposal sort of wonderful um, Jesuit architects, cartographers, so map makers, weapon makers, and so on and so forth. So the 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 traditional view of late Qing China, which sort of comes through the sort of more popular interpretation of the McCartney embassy as shut off from the world and kind of arrogant, thinking it self-sufficient, um, um, I don't think stands up anymore. Yes, I, th I think too, the, the scientific goods that McCartney took with him were also demonstrated in a rather kind of I don't know, a, a sort of jokey kind of, I mean, they took a, a diving bell um, and try and persuade people to go down in it. And they also, I think they had a, 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 a hot air balloon, which they never managed to get to work. I mean, it, it wasn't really a very kind of serious effort to persuade the Chinese about British engineering in particular. Um, I have another question here from, from Mary Chapman. In case my message got lost, thank you so much for your wonderful talks. This is a question, I'm, I'm wondering about the aftermath of the Opium Wars i.e. why and how British were involved in the Taiping Rebellion. Whose side were they on and why? I don't know if this is one really for, for how. Um, I think is, this is, is more for Julia. Taiping right? one of your areas? <laughs> uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to take yeah. that. Um, 1860, that's the close of the Second Opium War, and things look absolutely terrible for the Qing, sort of 1860 to 61. So um, uh, the the emperor who's on the throne during the um, Second Opium War, Xianfeng, has fled Beijing. He's sort of taken refuge in um, uh, a summer retreat. Um, and he's always had poor health. He dies in 1861, um, young, um, uh, leaving. He does have a male heir, but the, the boy is very, very young. Um, and so this moment sort of ushers in a period of um, instability in the succession uh, because Qing emperors up to that point had been quite productive of children and heirs and had lived long enough for their children to um, be at least young adults by the time that they took the throne. Um, but um, this, this, this child is very, very young. Um, so you have to have a regency put in place, which includes two of the Xianfeng emperors, uh, empresses. So you have women in charge as well, which is um, uh, can lead to uh, political stability, not, not because they're women, but because there's, there tends to be more, more, more jostling for power. Um, and most critically of all, so you've had the defeat in the Second Opium War, but most critically of all, you've got a huge civil conflict waging sort of all across the southern part of the country. And that is the so the the, the Taiping War, sometimes known as the Taiping Rebellion. Um, and this um, the, 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 the Taiping sort of base their kind of political, socio-economic, religious philosophy on a um, rather distorted um, interpretation of kind of Old Testament Christianity. Um, but because of this sort of the um, partly, I think, because of the um, sort of foreign origins of their ideology, I think they're able to see themselves as a more sort of radical 
alternative or threat to the Qing than some of the sort of more traditional folk millenarian rebellions, which have also been sort of kicking off in China sort of from the late 18th century onwards. Um, but it's sort of roughly at this moment that the, um, the, the, the European empires um, plus the United States, they decide that actually um, uh, the Qing are the best power to go to, 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 to go with. They have a couple, I think the British have a couple of uh, encounters with the Taipings um, and they, 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 they feel that the, the spin on Christianity is not something that they can really get behind. So Hong Xiu Chen, who is the um, king of the Taipings, um, famously called himself um, uh, Jesus Christ's Chinese brother. Um, so, uh, uh, and um, the, 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 the British politicians and officials and missionaries who encounter him um, don't subscribe to this particular rigid, religious program. So the British at that point, you know, having wavered, they decide they're going to stick with the Qing. This is their best hope for sort of steadying the ship of China. Um, and so uh, they help, they, they, they help help uh, train Qing troops in sort of more sort of modern battle techniques. Um, they uh, co uh, cooperate with the um, uh, with with Qing officials in building sort of armories and arsenals. So the interesting moment of 1861, it seems to be utterly cataclysmic. You know, at this point, people just can't imagine the Qing surviving um, even a handful of years. But you actually end up seeing what's sort of called as a kind of fluorescence of um, uh, Chinese economy, society, culture and politics uh, between the 1860s and 1880s um, and you know partly thanks to a little bit of help from uh, British, French and American uh, soldiers um, they uh, in 1864 they managed to finally uh, at huge huge human cost uh, put an end to the Taiping War uh, but it's estimate I mean it understandings of uh, how many people died are a little bit hazy, but estimates veer between 20 and 70 million unnatural deaths um, during the Taiping Civil War. Um, so it, you know, it really is the, the, the worst civil war in human history. So that we've got a wonderfully broad audience, which is great. Got a question for Anne. Did Chinese fashion and creative output impact Western taste? In a quick slide, you mentioned the ballet, but were there any other lasting effects? Um, yes, I would say definitely, definitely affected fashion. Um, from, from the 1920s, um, something I've been working on, which, which also alludes to that spectrum of sinophobia and sinophilia, um, I, I think that, one of the things that women did after the First World War, they got the vote, um, they really embraced Chinese style. And this was almost in response to its association with the risque, the forbidden, the disapproved of, um, that all went along with the yellow peril. And I think it was sort of a deliberate conscious, unconscious, I don't know how things work, you know, in the fashion zeitgeist, but this embrace of Chinese style um, was something liberating for women, definitely in the 1920s. And I've been looking at, in the British Library, at Vogue magazines from the 1920s, and China, Chinese stuff is everywhere. There were so many curio shops selling antique things from China. There was... Chinese fabrics, Chinese style in all the fashion shows from Paris that were being reported. I mean, I started looking, thinking, I, hoping I might find stuff and it's just all the way through. Um, so I think that there's a big embrace of, of fashion um, that's never really disappeared throughout the 20th century in, into our own time. Um, and, you know, the fashion for Shinwazri comes and goes and interior decor and and, stuff so um yeah i think does that answer the question i think it's um this is again an area that you're looking into yeah. you may hear more we hope <laughs>
Yeah, I, definitely. Um, and, and, and also something that is critiqued as well. So, you know, I'm looking at works of fiction where women are described, you know, if, if women's behavior is disapproved of, they're described in terms of Chinese style. But that's something I'll, you'll be hearing more of, I think. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to Anne? I, I'm aware that, for example, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb also drives a kind of fever for Egyptian-style fashions, you know, sort of Paris fashion runways, architectural styles, cigarette packets, and so on. Is is that does that intercross at all anywhere with the chinoiserie of the 1920s? I mean, with the Tutankhamun Egyptian fever seems to sort of very much merge with modernist archaeology i'm sorry modernist architecture and and fashion and so on yeah is there any intersection yeah there they're, they kind of happen at parallel times actually so so you see this embrace vogue reports on this embrace of of the egyptian and the chinese and then they'll go oh hindu hindu chinese or indo chinese or and egyptian it, there's it's it's all very exotic of course but there's um there's a big embrace of it and um it comes from america as well the fashion for mahjong the game everybody wants to dress up in chinese robes to play mahjong and then mahjong is marketed it, it starts as really upper class thing where churchill and mountbatten are playing mahjong and then it filters down and they're, they're putting on lessons at selfridges for it and and then there's the dancing when the Hammersmith Palais opens. The dance floor is a Chinese pagoda dance floor. Um, there's so much that has been forgotten about that. But um, Ro Professor Roger Luckhurst has written a book about the Egyptian style um, that that looks at all of that. Yeah, so they 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 do go hand in hand. I think very similar, um, very similar desire for interesting foreign stuff really but it sounds like you feel that this moment this cultural moment 20s 30s of of, of sino um sino fever if you like in british popular culture has been forgotten when do you think it was forgotten and why um i i'm trying to think i think that the Roaring Twenties or the Jazz Age or, you know, it was this period of like um, excess, wasn't it? And then I think in the 1930s, as things globally became a lot harsher, you have the Depression and then you have the rise of fascism and things got more serious. And I think um, pol politics took over, things got more serious and fashion took a back back foot then. I think that's probably why. Um, but then having said that, with what I've just been talking about just now, um, actual Chinese culture comes to London in the big Burlington House exhibition. Um, the, the, the people I've just been speaking about suddenly got a voice. It's not, you know, in Xinhua's reinterpretations of China, it's real China come to visit. You know, the Chinese government sends over the, the artworks for the exhibition. And so you get that little flowering before the Second World War shuts all that down. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, but it's clear that we could go, well, I'd love to hear us go on <laughs> and on in so many different directions. But I just must thank these all these panellists extremely, William Poole, Julia Lovell, Gaha and Anne Wichard. Thank you very, very much indeed for an incredibly varied and um, fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much, Francis.